everyone. So um, tonight's Beef and Lamb Central Otago Farming for Profit Winter webinar series. Um, this series has been designed to provide you with practical and insightful information to help navigate the challenging economic times and highlight future opportunities. Um, tonight's session is the third and final webinar in our series. Um, the first one we covered two weeks ago, which was focused on getting bang for your buck from fertiliser. And last week we had a session on um, research with um, some researchers from Massey, Lincoln and Egg Research highlighting the work that they're doing to enhance sheep and beef profitability. Tonight's webinar focuses on financial management with the aim of assisting you with navigating the current high cost environment and tips and tricks um, from an experienced chartered accountant. And uh, we're privileged to have us joining us here tonight, George Collier um, from ICL and Nick Beebe uh, from Beef and Land New Zealand. Just a couple of notes before we get started. Um, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar as you think of them. So to do that, just hover your mouse over the screen and a um, chat icon will appear down the bottom. If you click on that and type your question into the chat box, um, I'll record all of those and put them to our speakers at the end of the session. Um, and just a reminder also to have your cameras um, and audio turned off throughout. Um, I'll just introduce our first speaker now. Um, we're very privileged to be joined tonight by George Collier. George is a chartered accountant and one of the directors at um, Alexandra-based accounting firm ICL. Um, George has been working as a chartered accountant for the last 25 years um, and prior to that worked as a farm consultant for Ag First. Um, George is going to provide us with an overview of the work, um, an overview and some tips and tricks um, on financial management and um, ways that you can navigate your business through the current times. I'll hand over to you, George. Hi, thanks, Nick. Uh, what I'll do, Nick, is just bring this um, presentation up on the screen. Here we go. Yep. So I'm managing farming business through a high cost environment. So what I'll uh, go through tonight is um, some principles uh, around um, managing costs, but also looking at the big picture of the farming business uh, and, and the various principles I just want to work through is um, what does history tell us in terms of farming businesses, particularly sheep and beef farming businesses? I want to talk a little bit about cost. Uh, because sometimes uh, cost is not always cost. Uh, reducing costs, some of the short-term, medium-term, long-term options, uh, potentially some ways to find cash when times are, are quite tough, uh, protecting income streams, and um, managing the financial plan and their relationship with bankers, and just talk about some summary points. I thought I'd start off this evening just talking a little bit about our farm survey, uh, which has been running for about 30 years, but I've just grabbed the last 22 years. And this is a graph of um, the allocation of gross income, the total income of the farming business. And so what we've got down here is the debt servicing as a percentage of the income. So back in 2001, that might've been 10%. And we've got this um, column here in the red, which is, which is farm working expenses. So that might have been, say, 50, 55%. And then we've got this surplus, the surplus from farming after debt servicing and farm working expenses. And that was 25% here. So what we can see when we look through the years, that there's a bit of a roll going on here. And uh, we've got some really good years. 2012 was a really good year for sheep and beef farms. Uh, Prices were high, production was good, uh, and uh, costs were, were controlled. And then we've got some other reasonable sort of surpluses. In the last four or five years, it's been a, a really good time for sheep and beef. Um, but we put the 23 results in here, of course, the surplus will be a lot less now. Uh, but I think it gives some perspective is that we had some really tough times back here through the uh, 26, 27, 28 with the global financial crisis. Uh, costs going up, but also interest rates going up. But more importantly, 
the, the biggest impact here was actually a reduction in income and the impact that that actually had on the um, percentage of cost to the farming business. The second one I just wanted to talk about was the balance sheets of farming businesses. Generally over time, what we've found is that the balance sheet of most sheep and beef farming businesses has really strengthened. Because back in the early 2000s, we had a total value, including the value of stock of about $300 a stock unit. And over time, uh, through 2022, uh, that's gone to about nearly um, 1,400 a stock unit, including land value. Uh, but the debt over that time sort of gone from 100 uh, to uh, around um, 250. Uh, so the equity, of course, has grown enormously over that period. So the average sheep and beef business has probably got 80 to 85% equity within it, a really strong balance sheet. Uh, the third one I wanted to talk about in terms of, <clears throat> in terms of uh, the history of our farming businesses is the return. And, and we don't always measure this, I guess, in a true sense uh, within a farming business, but what's the return on capital uh, from the operating business? So this is the blue line here. And this return on the operating business is based on a revalued land value over time. So starting at that, you know, $250 here coming through to our $1,150 uh, $1, over here. Uh, so this last year, uh, we're getting, um, you know, or 2022, about a 3.4% return uh, for that, um, for that uh, 2022 year. And in 2012, of course, we've got, the, this is the medium property. So this is the the, the property within our database that's right in the middle or the, or the average, if you like, um, a 6% return. If we looked at the blue line over time, it's about 2.4%. This orange line here is the capital growth in the business over time. And that's simply <clears throat> the uh, growth in the assets over time. Uh, that line there, sometimes we have no growth and you could have argued through here, maybe some negative growth. Uh, and again, lately, the land price is just picking up again. So we've got another part of the business, which is the real estate business, which has got about 6.5%. Uh, and, and that's this return on investment here, the operating business 2.4, land ownership 6, 6.1, is it? So total return of 8.5%. And of course, these fluctuate over time. If we looked at that earlier graph, the average debt servicing over those 23 years is 14%. The average farm working expenses to gross farm income is about 62%. So we've got a surplus of about 24%. And in reality, that's the sort of surplus we do need to take our businesses for. That's really the minimum we need uh, to, to cater for drawings, plant replacement, principal repayments, tax, other personal allowances, principal repayment. Uh, cash surplus. So ideally that would be uh, that would be 30% plus. Uh, so I think what we're seeing is that cycles do tend to roll um, and uh, and uh, that the up cycles tend to be a lot longer than the down cycles. Not much consolation in this sort of environment, but you know we do have to look at history and it does tell us that sometimes we have to dig a little bit deeper uh, to hang in there for the inevitable uh, up cycles that will come. So just talk about cost. Cost is not always cost because uh, what I've compared here is our, is our medium farmer or our average farmer returns across our whole entire database of farmers, uh, which are our, our fine wool, our hill country who might be half bred, um, cross bred, our valley floor, type operations in Central Otago and our South and West Otago group. And we've got an average farm size of 6,200 stock units. We've got a top 20% now, just slightly bigger. Uh, but what we've got is an income level of $146 a stock unit. What I really want to talk about was the cost. The cost is very, very similar for the top group compared to this average group. And so, uh, the result of all of that is when you look at these differences in income per stock unit, income per hectare, 
is that you end up with these surpluses that are a lot more and uh, per hectare per stock unit, but also these ratios uh, that, um, that look uh, a lot uh, stronger from a financial perspective. Uh, so, you know, having lower farm working expenses, um, debt servicing relatively the same, much the same debt loading per stock unit, actually slightly more, more uh, debt loading per stock unit for this top group, but it's just that their interest as a percentage of income is a little bit lower. So they haven't got any less debt, this top group, uh, and they tend to find more magic in their business because their overall income is higher, um, uh, not necessarily their costs uh, per stock unit. So what's the difference? What's driving this top 20%? Essentially, they've got a little bit higher stocking rate per hectare, higher lambing percentage, all of these things that make a difference to the income in terms of land price, uh, wool price, hogget price, and they've got more production uh, from uh, a similar sort of area um, there and with this higher stocking rate. So the production is higher per stock unit and it's higher per hectare. But interestingly enough, even though their uh, costs are the same per stock unit, the cost per unit of production are 20% less. So I just, I guess I want to share the insights from uh, our farming client base uh, around that cost uh, per unit sold. Um, it's a really important concept. So by increasing productivity, we can reduce the cost per stock unit. And the real trick is how do we increase the productivity without putting too much more cost into the system? Uh, and so I've talked about some of those ones, uh, some of these things. So I won't, I won't dive into a lot of that. But, but uh, one of the key points is there's a more efficient process of converting feed into saleable product uh, is really what's happening there. Um, and in terms of income, we're tending to see within some of our farming systems, the valley floor, a little bit more cropping, dairy grazing, beef finishing. Uh, in our hill country, uh, we are starting to see quite a substantial difference in a um, pine wool sheep compared to a crossbred uh, sheep. And, and, and it's that difference uh, to do with the wool. The little trick in the whole thing is, is uh, can the other attributes be maintained around lambing percentage and lamb growth rates? And there certainly are some fine wool sheep that are having some very good uh, per head performance around some of these lambing percentage, lamb growth rates and those sort of things. But I think one of the little keys in terms of identifying opportunities within an individual farming system to grow income and therefore reduce cost is actually to think about uh, the options around modelling the farm system. Is there the opportunity to grow more feed? Is there the opportunity to utilise more feed? And what does each enterprise within the business actually return? And some of that can be done through uh, programs like uh, Farm Max. There's some really good uh, feed monitoring, uh, budgeting tools, planning tools that some farm consultants have also got available to them. Now, on to costs. Uh, what are the opportunities around short term costs? Uh, and so it's got short term, medium term, long term. Uh, short term, obviously, <clears throat> taking some cost out of the system. So slowing the pasture renewal process down, not completely desirable because we've got, always got lots and lots of run out pastures, but in the end, this will reduce costs because we're only sowing out 50% uh, of uh, our normal pasture uh, and that double cropping will actually save quite a lot of cost in that process. Uh, the employee to contract the model, uh, really hard pull to swallow if that's a course of action that, um, that is taken, but sometimes that cost of that full-time wage, vehicles, all those sort of things, rather than bringing a specialist in for certain tasks. Um, but it is, it is an option. Consolidation mode, so stopping development. And sometimes that's a way of thinking uh, that we've just got to slow things down here. Uh, needs versus wants, do we need that new tractor? Uh, do we, um, can we continue with, with that old tractor? Now, I do remember, Funny sort of story, really, but a farmer um, rang me up, had 9,800 hours on his tractor, and he said, I, I'm not quite sure what to do. It's not breaking out, it's actually quite reliable, but um, 
he really couldn't afford a new tractor. And then um, a couple of months later, he rang me up all excited to say that he'd, he'd now had a tractor with uh, 120 hours on. Of course, that's because the clock rolled over. Uh, but it was sort of a way of thinking, I guess. So this r &E mode, rather than um, capital replacement mode, postponed principal repayments. That's become really, really common in the last, um, last six uh, months. Uh, but certainly starting again um, when the inevitable upswing happens. So it's really a principal uh, postponement um, and maybe starting off with smaller payments. Um, so a lot of farmers are actually voluntarily making principal payments rather than locking in uh, to something, rather than building an overdraft, they'll make, make it when they genuinely have uh, cash surpluses. Life insurance, I've certainly had a few farmers cash ups in life insurance in the last uh, few months, uh, and some of those life insurances have risen actually in, in very recent times to, to quite high levels. Uh, some of them have borrowed against them rather than cashing them up. Uh, drawings. There's a huge variation in drawings and some farming businesses can sustain really high levels of drawings and others actually can't. Uh, and, you know, this might be one of those times we have to look at every aspect of the business. Uh, but that's the um, average or medium amount of cash drawings that, uh, that our client base has taken for the 2022 year. And just as an aside, I guess, what does that equal in terms of taxable income? A little multiplier there of 1.7 uh, comes up to 122,000 taxable income. So I'll just go into a couple of these in a wee bit more uh, detail. <coughs> Drawings is actually an issue for some farming businesses. And, and so what are some of the little tricks with this? And I talked to a couple of bankers over the last week, and these are some of the things that they've identified, uh, having that automatic payment uh, taking it across from the farm account into the personal account um, and measuring some of the various components to it, uh, minimising expenses on farm cards, some of those sort of things, and just measuring those individual components. Uh, if we can measure it, we can manage it. So if we're having cash flow problems, uh, what, are the, what are the options? Delaying payments, we can do that through merchandise firms, fertiliser companies, suppliers. And tax, we can also do tax. We can delay tax payments uh, through an arrangement with the IRD. Their interest rates are 10.4%, or through Tax Management New Zealand. We've got quite a few clients doing it, not just for farming businesses, but for commercial businesses as well, where they're getting into perhaps quite a tight uh, cash flow time, and they just need three or four months uh, before they make some of those tax payments. And so you can have an arrangement with Tax Management New Zealand, and we are doing that regularly. Uh, revising tax payments uh, this, this year, uh, and right at the moment, of course, we're looking at quite a lot of cash flows for sheep and beef farmers, also dairy farmers, and just seeing whether these uh, last tax payments should be revised down. And that could also apply to the coming year. So that's got some... Uh, real merit. And if those tax payments are a little bit short, then we can pick them up through Tax Management New Zealand. Sources of cash, uh, we can get some of those perhaps by, uh, you know, our life assurance, um, maybe subdividing off uh, lifestyle blocks, surplus machinery, selling plant and leasing back. So we have had the other client doing that. ETS registration, that's really a source of income, not really a um, a cost saving, but uh, we have got some clients involved in that, and I've got one recently that'll that'll end up with an annual annual income stream of two to three hundred thousand from their native vegetation, which is really significant. And off farm income, are there opportunities around some of that? Uh, our average client is probably about twenty thousand uh, dollars from off farm income. So medium term cost reductions. I think uh, two weeks ago, Nick, that uh, there's quite a discussion around fertiliser, and a lot of farmers have um, taken up the opportunity of doing a lot more intensive soil testing, and there's the opportunity to uh, be a bit more strategic with fertiliser input if you've got high levels of Olsen P. Because the main limiting factor, of course, in our environment, Central Otago, much of the South Island is sulphur, and um, we really need to continue with our sulfur inputs, but we can actually um, do that um, and pull our Olsen P levels back. I had a client recently where they tested their property, 40% of the paddocks 
were over 35 and also P of 35. And so they could apply um, just under half rates for most of the, the um, property because a lot of the hill country was up over 20 as well. Um, and they could take about 50 to 60 percent, um, uh, 50 percent off their fertiliser bill because their ulcers and peas had been building up for so long uh, that they have got a period where they can actually pull them back a bit and not really lose any production, uh, well above optimal. Ask him, like I said, we're hearing a lot of noise in the market about having lots and lots of species in a pasture mix, but we heard from Derek Merck last week, there's no real production benefit um, above having two to three species in, in, in a mix. Not from a dry matter perspective, perhaps there are, uh, is the odd production um, uh, increase potentially sometimes. I'm not 100% sure about this actually. But um, in terms of dry matter production, certainly nothing about two, two, to, two to three species, but maybe from an animal perspective, sometimes there is. And the cost of seed mixture, with the more species we put into it, the massive increase in uh, costs. Um, buying in advance, uh, ACC planning, uh, just getting some of our classifications right, and perhaps nominating a suitable cover, which might be higher than. Uh, what we're getting charged from an ACC perspective. And insurance, um, there's quite a lot of opportunity perhaps um, within a farm business to look at the cost of insurance. Cost of insurance has gone up about 12 to 15% for about the last um, eight or nine years. It's way ahead of inflation. And, um, and so insurance is really looking at the big risks within our business. If we have high excesses, it can save us a lot of money. That's on farm, that's health insurance, um, that's income protection, some of those sort of things. And I guess the point at the bottom here is that getting an independent view on your insurance cost, um, I think is really important, particularly when it comes to life insurance uh, and some of those sort of things, because in the end, insurance agents are rewarded for how much insurance they sell. So it's pretty hard to be an independent insurance agent. I think, oops, we've gone one too far there. Um, uh, benchmarking. So benchmarking, if we want to look at the opportunities in our business for perhaps uh, reducing costs and benchmarking all of our costs within the business on a line-by-line -line basis has got a lot of merit. So that's a per stock unit. In some cases, it might be per hectare. There's a lot of sources for that information. Interest rate management is a really interesting one. And, and over recent years, of course, uh, anyone that's been on a variable rate has, has been on the winning side of things. But if you're on a fixed rate, it does tend to reduce the variability. Uh, and the lows won't be ever so low, but the highs won't be as high either. And so some <clears throat> highly indebted farmers uh, do tend to have a, a spread of fixed rate terms so that they're not, they don't have too much on floating at any one time. Really risk management, I guess. Reducing costs in the long term. And I think that really relates to feed and the cost of feed because that's the core constraint within our business. And how do we do that? We fit a farm system to the feed growth curve. We try and shift less, less feed from period to period. Uh, we try and match feed supply and feed demand, and we try and improve feed quality. Uh, and of course, it's really the mix of stock that fit into that feed curve, both from the property people and the complementary aspect. So cost of feed, if we look at feed, we've got pasture at five to eight cents. So the fertilised pasture is at, you know, seven, eight cents a kg. Um, crop, 12 to 16 supplements. Uh, so it really is about maximising this pasture one, uh, minimising this one. Uh, but if we are doing crop, uh, improving the yield, we're doing supplements, having high quality, and uh, making sure we're getting good utilisation. And core to this one here is managing our pastures to get lots and lots of quality feed and get that regrowth to feed. Uh, so I won't talk through all of those. Um, but pasture persistence is just critical in terms of reducing costs. I mean, how often have we seen pastures that have been sown in the last three or four years 
the cost of that is absolutely enormous. Uh, and that's, of course, influenced by all these things here. Grazing management is just massive in that, um, in that department. Dry environments, having a suitable plant for, for our environments. I mean, Lucerne will produce a lot more feed per kilogram of uh, per millimetre of rainfall than white clover ryegrass, but also we need to balance the feed. Long-term genetics are just going to play such a massive part in every single farming business in terms of worm tolerance. And, and you know, I've put up just one example here, crossbred sheep farmers, uh, wool of sheep seems an enormously um, challenging uh, discussion really, but the cost of shearing is just enormous. Um, and when we're getting the returns we're getting for uh, wool, well, um, some of those sort of discussions are required. But of course, we need the, the genetic base to do that. And at the moment, we've got wool I think we've got the Wairiri Nudie, but the, the genetic base is quite limited and we need to make sure we maintain those other attributes of our reproductive and our growth rates if we're going down that path. Uh, so... Lastly, um, just before I summarise, uh, what does the financial plan look like in managing the banking relationship? So it's really around communication. Um, and uh, if we're having challenges <clears throat> with our um, cash flow, uh, communication is the key. Uh, no surprises basis. What banks are looking for is what our strategy is, articulating our story. Um, and they need to know, of course, what our funding limits are well in advance, so many months in advance. They are looking for this principal payment over, over time, and they will reward good financial performance, good financial management, <coughs> and uh, that proactive communication. So what would um, proactivity look like? Cash flows with assumptions, livestock reconciliations, articulating the story, what our overdraft peaks will be, um, and sometimes those budgets can be two to three years out. So it's telling the story, looking into the future, involving the bank manager and regular updates um, and explanations around that. The other concept is reverse budgeting and it's almost doing an upside down budget. Uh, cash surplus required, drawings, putting all, in all these six ones and then working out what our farm income needs to be. This is actually a way, I guess, of creating some lateral thinking uh, and um, has been used from time to time. So just to summarise, uh, managing cash is key. Have a budget, uh, hold yourself to account. Um, when budgeting for the bank, uh, always be conserved in terms of income and advancing expenditure. Realistic, uh, regularly revise. Work out what really is a need rather than a want and um, use all your options of, at all possible to protect that overdraft limit. So that might be delaying payments through the IRD and those sort of things. Maintaining fertiliser, I think, is critical over time. <clears throat> and yes, we can have a, have a small holiday from time to time, but what we know is that pasture production drops by about 5% per annum, up to about seven years. 35% uh, of it of our production disappears, but not only that, the quality of our feed uh, drifts down. But um, having a component of elemental sulfur in our fertilizer does allow us an opportunity to have a wee bit of flexibility because not all the sulfur is used at one time. Whoops. Um, the uh, communication, we've talked about that. Down cycles tend to be shorter than the, uh, the inevitable uh, up cycles. Um, and working through what's an optimal farming system, modelling uh, options for high revenue uh, at medium cost. Um, in the end, levers can be pulled to reduce expenses, increase income or delay it, cash outgoings in the shorter term. But in the medium to long term, we do need a, um, a robust strategy. So I'll hand it back to you, Nick. That was wonderful. Thank you very much for that, George. Um, I think, yeah, you've provided some really good tips and tricks for both the short and medium term, which hopefully people can take home and apply to their own farm businesses. 
But I think this presentation's also really highlighted the significant value that farmers can get from really utilizing their trusted advisors when times get tough. Um, don't, you know, don't be scared to ask questions and really draw on the knowledge and experience that those guys have because um, it'll add value to your business. So that's great. I'll um, put a link on our Facebook page. That's the Beef and Lamb Central Otago Farming for Profit Facebook page um, to the ICL Farm Survey. So if you would like to read um, any more or better understand the benchmarking data, there's some really good information in there. Um, on local farm businesses across four farm classes in our region. Um, and I also put for those in other regions um, a link to the Beef and Lamb Economic Service, um, which has net nationwide benchmarking data across a full range of farm classes. So um, no doubt you'll get some value from that. Um, just a reminder before we head to Nick is to put any questions that you've got for George in the chat box and we'll um, present them to him at the end of the session. Cool, thanks, George. Um, our next speaker is Nick Beebe. Nick is the General Manager of Market Development at Beef and Lamb New Zealand. Um, and he's going to provide us with some insight into global markets for sheep and beef and hopefully give us something to remain positive about uh, looking forward. So thanks, Nick. I'll hand over to you. Uh, good evening, everyone, and um, look, thanks for the opportunity to, to talk to you tonight. But I'm just really going to cover um, three main uh, topics in my presentation tonight. The first is just to give you a, a bit of a snapshot of what's driving um, consumers. So what are those main consumer trends out there at the moment? Um, also, you know, consumers are one side, uh, but it's also around the key customers in the market as well. So what are some of their expectations and how are they evolving? That's the second part. And thirdly, I just wanna really um, quickly touch on what some of our um, key competitors uh, are up to as, as well. So those are the three things I want to quickly cover um, tonight. So just um, to move straight into um, some of those main consumer trends and you know, it is um, dinner time, so that's uh, a pretty nice looking um, steak, but one of those, the, the number one factor that is out there, and it's been this way for, for decades in the past, and it will be this way um, into the future as well. Um, when consumers decide whether they like a product, um, taste is the most important factor. Um, if you're looking to spend, if you think about now overseas markets, whether it be the US, um, Europe, or or parts of Asia as well, when people look to indulge and spend money on buying um, some of the, the nicest products, uh, they want to. Make, it has to taste great. Um, and when George um, was talking previously around the importance of of genetics, um, you know, genetics obviously plays a key part in, in the taste of the product as well. So taste really does um, matter. It's what gets people interested in the product and it what's, will keep bringing them um, back to the product as well. And you can just see um, you know, some of the stats there in terms of uh, um, consumers and, and what's driving them. But one of the, when we think of taste, consumers will always buy with their eyes. And this is just a, a snapshot from uh, just a very typical supermarket in, in the US. And this is what our beef is, is going up against. So the quality of the product um, you know, really does start from the farm. And we have to make sure that we can compete with a lot of this grain fed product that you'll see in, in front of you. And that marbling um, really does play a key part in, in that. The second um, big driver around consumers at the moment is health and wellness. And this trend has, I mean, it has been important for, for quite some time, but it really did um, take off through uh, COVID. Consumers are looking to buy food that they believe will, um, I suppose, assist uh, their own health and and well-being, and for us and for New Zealand, you know, grass-fed is is one of those key attributes that consumers look for when they're wanting to buy food 
that is um, will benefit them. And if you go into the US of the market in any supermarket, you can buy products. These are all natural products, but they've been fortified um, with you know, God knows how many um, supplements uh, in them. There is whole supermarket aisles of what these you know, natural products fortified with a whole range of additives. One of the, the newest ones is um, what people are now calling aptogenic. Um, and you can see that this is um, a, a tea drink uh, fortified with, with mushrooms. And these are all now um, apparently completely legal in, in California. Um, but there's just another way where consumers uh, are buying a good based on the, um, the functionalities of, of that product. And this, um, these space teas, um, they'll be, um, they're, they're promoted on making you, you know, restful at night and you know, giving you energy during, during the day. When you actually ask these companies around what is the, the scientific benefit they will provide, they can be very vague on, on those types of things, but they are really relying on some of those big trends and um, consumer comfort area and mushrooms. Um, well, the use of mushrooms in food dates back in, into um, Chinese cooking from, from a whole uh, centuries ago. So food as medicine, it, you know, this is not a new concept but it's, um, it's really taking off and uh, being found in very interesting forms now as well. The third big uh, trend is around the, the Regenerable. And this is consumers um, making more conscious decisions uh, around the food that they purchase. And you can really... Um, see this, you know, we monitor uh, social media in our main markets around, around the world. And when there is a, a climate catastrophe, uh, like wildfires in, in California or floods or cyclones or hurricanes, uh, consumers will definitely care more um, uh, about the food that they purchase. So it's no longer about eating sustainably, um, which is... Uh, implies a state of preserving what it is. The, the new generation wants food from companies that are actively healing the planet. Um, so that's, and it's not just small companies that are really getting into, into this. It's some of the biggest companies in the world like PepsiCo, um, uh, Nestle, Danone, um, and the like. So yeah, these are trends that will shape the, the future um, for us, and you can start. To, I mean, we are already witnessing, um, and, you know, a lot of these products. And whilst it's still niche, but there is a lot of um, products entering into certain supermarket chains, um, particularly in some of the more advanced markets like like the US now. So it's still very niche, um, but it's uh, certainly gaining traction. So those three big consumer trends really are around taste, health and, and well-being and uh, consumers buying products off, uh, off their own values. Um, the holy grail is to get products that combine all of these um, items and that's really where in New Zealand and our natural um, production systems really does meet um, these consumer trends right um, in the in the middle. So for New Zealand as a food producing nation and as a grass fed nation, um, you know, we are lucky that we meet all these big, big trends. Consumers will always, they'll look for um, a cue on the product that um, leads them to believe these things are happening. And for many of the many consumers or the consumers that we're targeting, grass fed is that cue on packaging. It means that it not only tastes better, um, but it's going to be better for me and it's probably going to be better for, for the planet as, as well. So just to move into some of these customer expectations and this is, you know, 
these are the big gatekeepers um, for New Zealand um, getting access into the market. And so their expectations have always been around the you know, high food safety standards, best practice animal welfare standards, uh, making sure we're looking after those five domains. But it's really moved from being able to tell a great story to actually proving that we um, are doing exactly what we say. So that whole area around certification and validation has become incredibly important um, for these customers as well. And there are some really big emerging themes that are, that's becoming quite obvious that, that they care about. And those, you know, those themes are probably no surprise to you, but they are around um, how we are addressing climate change, how we're taking care of the soil and, and the water and the biodiversity of New Zealand. So these themes are, are very real and starting to be raised by customers around, around the world. And for New Zealand, you know, we're incredibly lucky that uh, we have a now have a um, national farm assurance program for the red meat and wool sectors, and that's the New Zealand Farm Assur or New Zealand Farm Assurance Incorporated, which owns the two programs, NZFAP and NZFAP Plus. For farmers that are involved in in these programs, this is the way that. Um, their farming systems um, can be verified and certified uh, to get that um, market and customer access that, that we enjoy. So you know, these programs you know, will always continue to evolve as those um, consumer and customer expectations evolve. But it's one of those opportunities to meet the market is, is to get involved in, in these programs. So just in terms, I know I don't have um, uh, too much time, but so just quickly, you know, the third part of this is really around what our key competitors are up to because consumer trends and customer expectations is, is one thing, but we live in, also live in the very much in the real world where um, what our competitors are doing matters. And you know, at the moment, the red meat market in um, the markets that we supply is incredibly competitive. Uh, and it's, in, it's very competitive because consumer demand has been uh, dampened over the last um, six or so months uh, as you know, recessions and um, inflation uh, concerns start, start to increase. At the same time, we've seen increased production or in increased exports from some of our main competitors, um, you know, the likes of, of Australia. And so that's making, um, you know, putting some real competitive pressure on the short term for, for New Zealand and both in the beef and, and in the sheep meat side. But one of the opportunities that we also have is that recently, um, and hopefully you've heard that uh, New Zealand signed uh, free trade agreement with the UK. And whilst we've always had great access there into the UK for sheep meat, um, what we got this time was some fantastic access for, for beef as well. So in the first year, we got 12,000 tonnes of, of access for beef. And over the next uh, 15 years, that will go up to 60,000 tonnes of access. And then after that, it is... Um, uh, complete free trade um, environment. These markets will take time. And like every other market around the world, they will be very competitive. Um, but it now provides New Zealand another opportunity or another market to actually develop for, for beef. We've been incredibly successful in the UK for lamb over the past 140 years. Um, so this new opportunity for beef into the UK for New Zealand is something that will start small, um, but it will hopefully grow uh, with real commitment um, from the meat companies to assist in that, in that growth. So look, that's just a very quick snapshot um, from me, just a reminder of the three things. Consumer trends, it is all around um, taste, health and wellness, and consumers purchasing products uh, that have similar values to their own. 
customer expectations are evolving and they are looking deeper um, into those areas around climate change and how we care for the environment and telling a great story isn't enough. We have to prove, verify and certify that those um, our farming standards meet their needs. And thirdly, um, we are in a very competitive environment uh, in the in the short term, which will make the um, the next uh, few months relatively tough. But that's all all from me, Nick. That's great. Thank you very much for that, Nick. Um, that was really great to highlight the the fundamentals that underpin uh, new, new, the value that New Zealand Red Meat um, gets around taste, health, and sustainable principles. And it's also always reassuring to know that um, we're well positioned and the pathway that we're taking to produce our products. Um, I've just got one question that's come in from Mike. Um, are the policy makers for farm environment plans coordinating with NZFAP? So, um, uh, yep. So, I will, I will answer that, that question. That's okay. Yep. Um, so, just to be um, very clear, New Zealand Farm Assurance Incorporated is not a regulator um, and we never will be, but we are. Um, working with um, some of the policy makers to ensure that there is um, no duplication as, as well. So uh, yes, we are, we are working with them. Cool, oh, um, and another question from Dan. Um, the New Zealand wine industry has done a great job, I presume, in means of marketing. Um, and wondering if you believe there's a possibility of working closely with them to make, uh, market a packaged or meat and wine. Yeah, yeah, and we, we, we actually already do um, through uh, Taste Pure Nature, which is the industry's um, country of origin proposition for, for New Zealand red meat. Um, we coordinate um, a range of activities with New Zealand wine and are always in um, close contact with, with them around opportunities in the, in the future. It does make a great pairing. Excellent. Um, that's all the questions that we've got come through the tech box. Um, so I'll just do a quick wrap up. Um, those are both really comprehensive presentations and I think they've um, clearly given some of our participants something to think about. So um, perhaps that's what they're still mulling over instead of typing in the tech box. Um, I just want to say a big thank you both to George and Nick. Um, this has been a really interesting session and I very much appreciate you giving up your evening to speak to us. Thanks to all those that have attended um, this webinar and the remainder of our webinar series. Hopefully um, the series has added value to your business and provided you with the confidence to be able to navigate um, your farm business going forward. We will put links up to these recordings on our Facebook page once they're available so that you can re-watch them at a later stage. Um, but other than that, that's all from me. Thank you all for attending.